Let's wait a couple of minutes before starting really with the class. Morning is very difficult for everybody, always. And, <laughs> and I just remember you, um, so what is the course about and, uh, and what I will do in, this, uh, in these three, uh, three lectures. So this one is not a new class, but it's the continuation of the class uh, given by Camilo de Lellis next week. So you know already what we are going to present, which is something on the regularity of minimal services. And actually, of what, what Camilo introduced, which are area minimizing. <coughs> cards, the integral cards. Okay, and Camilo show you the theory of integral currents and some of the um, in, and some of the issues that you see in the regularity for for codimension one currents. So especially he gave uh, a proof of um, a partial case of of the George's decay lemma, which is at the base of the study of the regularity for for codimension one currents. This week, we will see something related to higher codimension. So this one will be the focus of my, of my course. So understand some of the issues which are involved in the study of, of regular points and singular points in higher codimension minimal surfaces. And, um, the plan of the lecture is, in some sense, to focus on some of, this, of these issues, which are kind of, of, um, of basic, in my opinion, but uh, in, this, uh, in this theory. But in the simplest case, we can uh, meet. So now, this one will be clear in a while. So we will try to avoid all the technicalities to focus on the, on the geometrical and analytical problems which are behind. And maybe the best things to do is, is, uh, is to start with an example, and always to keep, to keep an example in mind, which I, I saw Camillo already introduce, and that's the examples. So that's kind of introduction via examples. As Camille already introduced a class of minimal currents in higher codimension, which are the complex varieties in, uh, in uh, CN or in, uh, in general in a Keller manifold. So, so since it's just an example, let me just introduce the most basic one, which is a, a complex scarf in C2. So the one which Camille introduced, I think, was uh, uh, ZW in C2 such that Z2 is equal to W3. So let's understand a bit the geometry of this, of this complex curve. So my favorite picture is, is try to write this as a, as, a, as a graph, which is clearly impossible, but gives kind of the ease to this, uh, uh, to the geometry of these objects. And if, if we write kind of naively, we have that Z somehow is one of the two square roots of W to the cube. So let me write, that's not, not correct, but it's plus or minus these two, two square roots. So in some sense, if here I put a two dimensional plane, so, Z in C, which is a real dimensional, a real two dimensional planes. And here I put W in C. So what I see is plus or minus, so Z is, is plus or minus W to the three half. So something which, which looks like this. So the, this one is V. Now what is V actually? If you see here, it seems kind of disconnected. 
but it's just a two-dimensional projection or, or of a four-dimensional space. So this V is living in C2, which is a real dimension for, which has four real dimensions. So what is actual V? V, if you see, it's, it's a, a very nice topological disk. So it's the image of the flat disk in R2 via a smooth parametrization. So V is equal U of B1 for B1, the unit ball in R2. And U goes from B1 to uh, R4. In the following, I will always identify this introduction, C with R2. We, and I mean, we can also give a, a parametrization for such, for, ch for such a map. So in polar coordinates, the parametrization is, is the following. So rho cos theta, rho sin theta, rho 3 half cos 3 theta, rho 3 half sin 3 theta. So it's the image under a continuous map of a disk. So actually, it's a very nice uh, surface, much more regular than a general, uh, uh, than a general currents. And if you see, this parametrization is actually very smooth. It's an embedding everywhere except at, at the origin, where it is just an immersion. So, so this one is, uh, just to put all this information together, it is an example of a minimal current in R4. So it's a two-dimensional minimal current in R4, which is regular everywhere except in the origin, where it is just immersed. And there's a kind of double point there. So what we will try to, uh, to analyze in this week is the behavior of these singular points here, which are called branch points. So in some sense, the aim of this, of, of what I'm going to, to, to present, is to find some uh, analytical way to understand the presence of this, of this such behavior. And this surface here is a, an example, a very clear example of why the, the techniques and the tools in codimension one cannot work in higher codimension. Because as Camillo showed you, the main parameters in codimension one for the regularity was the excess, which is an, an integral measure of, of the oscillation of uh, the tangent plane. And here the tangent plane is, is continuous there. So remember, this one is an immersion. is a C1 immersion. So in some sense, looking at the excess in this case would not detect the regular point. So that's just a remark. So the excess of this current V in BR, so around the origin, is going, is going to zero. So at a certain point, it becomes less than the constant in, in Allah's theorem. But nevertheless, the surface is not regular. So just looking at the excess is not enough to, to understand the regular, the singular points. And indeed, what we are going to see is something which is completely different somehow from codimension one. And different even in the results. So maybe I give you immediately the final results, which is something I mean we won't see in, in this course. It will be too long. But give in some sense, the idea why this theory is so different from the one in codimension one. And the result, I don't know if Camillo mentioned to you, in higher codimension, so in, um, in codimension one, so let's say, so which is the case of hypersurface. So we have that 
every every minimizing current is is regular. So regular means that it lives on a smooth manifold and is given on the integration by the an integration over this smooth manifold. Uh, it's regular in the interior. Um, except for a set of at most M minus seven dimension. So out of dimension. where M is uh, the dimension of the current. And this one is, uh, is the most basic result in co-dimension one. Actually, much more is known. But just to point the difference, we, we'll, we just talk about out of dimension. Which, I mean, for those of you who do not know what is out of dimension, just, just keep dimension. It's a very reasonable notion of dimension that you may introduce in these uh, in these problems in geometric analysis. And this one is a, a result of uh, a very long uh, uh, analysis and effort, which starts in the, with the, the Georgi and then was completed just in the 70s by uh, Algren, Federer, Allard, and many other authors, Simons, and so on. But what is striking is, is somehow the final result. If now I would like to write the final result in higher dimension, you see it changes completely. So in higher dimension, the singular set may exist. Is there an uh, objective algorithm which you can show that why is the seven case? I know that it's correct. I know that it's the theorem, but uh, can you give us some, something where we can see it's the seven case from? Not me. <laughs> so I mean, it, the question is where this this uh, this magic number is is, uh, is coming out. It doesn't mean for me it's uh, I think as magic as for the for most of the people. So if you see the computation, it comes from an analysis of the stabilities of cones, and then you see or or geometrically you you see as a possibility to foliate a space with a foliation which is singular in one of the leaves. But why this comes first in this dimension, I cannot, uh, I cannot say, honestly. I didn't say what is my degree of, of optimism, <laughs> because now <laughs> I knew before that. Yeah. <laughs> so in higher dimension, indeed, in, in, instead the singular set may have at most so is at most of dimension. So I was warned not to write down here. So just change. Blackboard is at most uh, m minus two, where m is always the, the dimension of our of our current. So you see, what changed is not the techniques and the way. Now I show you how to approach the problem, but the result itself is uh, is different, and this result is optimal. So we have shown already a curve which is a two-dimensional object. So m there is equal to two where we have a singular point. And the singular point is dimension zero. So this means that it can happen to have a, a minimal current with a singular set, which is m minus two as dimension. So it's not that we cannot prove more than this, but it's that this result is sharp. And this result, this theorem, is due to Amgren. So in the 80s. So now what I, we will do in this class is in some sense to understand some aspect of this, uh, of this theorem. 
revisit it with some, uh, some, um, some modern uh, terminology and modern concepts. So this one is somehow the starting point for our analysis. And again, I mean, uh, I think the best way to understand where to start is looking at, uh, at the examples I gave you. So the examples was the one of the complex curve B. Which is, so roughly speaking, Z equal was, Z equal plus or minus W3 half. But, but somehow correctly is the one given by, by the parameterization I, I wrote to you before. So, and why I would like to start from this picture? Because it gives somehow the idea of what we are going to do. And the point is, uh, in static minimal surface, uh, also in this very weak context of, uh, of minimal currents, all the effort is done somehow to reduce to the case to a, a non-parametric problem. So the case where we can use an equation, the minimal surface equation or the linearized equation, which is the Laplace equation in this case. Which is what Camillo showed you for Allard's theorem, that once you reduce to a graph, to a Lipschitz graph, then you may prove the decay of the excess, and then you transport this to the case of minimal currents. Now, the same we would like to do here. So we would like to write a non-parametric problem for these objects. But now you see, so from the picture it's not so clear, but I mean, you may realize by yourself by few computation is that uh, it is impossible to write this surface as a graph of a function. So morally, the tangent plane with respect to which we should parameterize this one is the tangent plane of the parameterization of the immersion, which is this horizontal plane here. So somehow, the first claim is that this horizontal plane is uh, the, the preferred one to write a parameterization. But around this point, there is no way to write this uh, V as a graph of a function. And the reason is because of this branch point. So if you start from, say, now let me write this at the plane W here, the W plane. So if you start from uh, a determination of the square root uh, at uh, E1, say, and then you follow a, a circle around the origin, you will end up somehow on the other determination of the square root. So there is somehow no way to write this as a graph, as, a, uh, as the union of two continuous graphs over the W plane. And that's because of the nature of the bridge points, which is exactly defined by these properties, that when you follow a continuous path around the point, you will end up with another determination of your, with another leaves of your coverings. So, and that's what, pre, what prevents to have a, a representation via a graph. Unless, I mean, we allowed for a singularity here, but we would like to solve an equation which gives regularity. So we cannot have something which is uh, discontinuous. So, somehow starting from the beginning, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of clear that we cannot use a very classical non-parametric theory for treating this problem. And here comes the first main idea of, uh, of, of Angre, which is okay. This one is not the graph of uh, a function, but above every point in the W space, we have two values of the Z, and always two. Also in the origin, because this one is, is a single point, but it's kind of approximated by by two points. And if you see the density in terms of currents, this one is a double point. So the density there is two. So the idea is, okay, we cannot treat this as a graph of a single value function. Let's treat it as a, as a graph of a multiple value function. So in this special case, the function is a, uh, so we can write kind of, um, of formally, it's a, so to each W, we associate two values, 
which are in, so let's write, I mean, kind of informally, but it's, uh, it's clear, which are w to the 3 half and minus w to the 3 half, somehow. So I have a map from a unit disk, say, in R2, to taking two values in R2. So which is this set here, which is a space that in a while I will introduce and, and we call atomic measure with mass two of R2. And now what is one of the main uh, points here, one of the main issues in this parameterization, that when I give you a determination of the square root, of a complex number. I cannot tell you in a, in a consistent way which square root I'm taking. Because as I showed you, once you follow any, any continuous path on the plane, which enclose the origin, the branch point, we change this uh, determination of the square root. So in this representation, what is important is that here I, I do not use these brackets. So it's not an order pair. I'm not saying what is the first value, what is the second value. I just give you the set of values. And that's, um, as a whole, it's, a, it's my, my value of my function. So this space here is not R2 squared. But it's, it's kind of new space of points, which is the space of an order of points. So that's kind of the, the beginning of the, of the analysis. So let's start from uh, introducing this space. Both times the same. Okay. So, but now it's clear from the, the, the definition. And this one is the space of, in this example of R2, we will always consider Q points, which was traditionally what was introduced by Amp. And let's put a, a, a sign here. That means that these two points is in whole, are not different two points somehow. So and the way to to formalize this concept is to take so there will be the two points in R N and I consider this as the atomic measures of mass Q in R N. So positive atomic measure of mass Q in R N. So I write the sum e from 1 to q of d Dirac deltas in pi. So this one is a, a Dirac delta, such that pi are points of array. And then you see these points are not necessarily uh, uh, different. So for example, a bridge point could be two times with zero. So our values will be always a measure, which is atomic, so living on, on delta, and mass Q. So positive with mass Q. So this one belongs to AQ of RL. And just to understand a bit this space, this is just a, a very nice formalism because we can think a bit about summing measures or stuff like this. But another point of view to see this space is actually the, the, the combinatorics one I was, I was kind of suggesting here. So it's true that it's a collection of Q points in Rn. So this space you may also see as Q copies 
of Aren, but then you have to take care of the of the order of the points. So you have to take a quotient via the equivalence relation of permutation. So P1, P2 is, is the same as uh, P2, P1. And this one gives you a bit the idea of the geometry of this space. So it looks like a Euclidean space because it's actually R to the nth cube. But then it's, uh, you, you took the quotient with, with this group of permutation. So you create some corners and some angles in this space. So the space, in the end, will turn out to be not a smooth space. And the, and the only structure we can give here, naively, so, so let's say the first structure we can give in this space is, is the one of a metric space. So let me introduce the metric for this space. So here we have a lot of freedom to design which metric, but it will be clear in a while why this one is a kind of the correct one. So traditionally it's, it's written like G for the metric. So this one is really the distance. So between two Q points T1, T2, and I imagine T1 is the sum of the deltas in Pi, and T2 is the sum of the deltas in uh, Si, say. So this one is the minimum among all the permutation of the square root of the sum always one to Q, of the Euclidean distance Pi minus S sigma I squared. So just to understand this as with the picture, we have two sets of, of Q points. So let's take the case of uh, exactly, uh, I don't know, two points, so T1 and T2. And we consider the pairing of one point with the others. So in this case, we have two. We have once these, and then we have another one, which is this. No, this is the only one. I shouldn't. No, it's this and this. Then we see which one realizes the minimum of this distance here, and this one will define the optimal pairing between these points. And last week, you had a week of optimal transportation. so. I think for you it's kind of now very clear that this distance here it's actually the the vastest time two distance in the space of measures in this very special case of uh, of uh, atomic measures so that's that's nothing else than the objects we have already seen uh, I think already in this uh, in this course and now it's very simple but this one is I will leave you as an exercise that this space of Q points with this metric is a complete metric space. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, I post some notes for the, for the class. So some of the material you find here and also some of the exercise with the ins also to solution are in the notes if you if you need to consult. But not th this one. This one is very simple. <laughs> OK. So, so now we have our space of points. Let's define what is a function to this space of points. So nothing easier, because now we have two metric space, and we just consider functions between two metric spaces. So let me, I should never erase the picture of the, of the complex variety. That's a, 
So stay there with us. So now, which kind of function we would like to, to look in this problem? So a function from a flat space, a Euclidean space, to this set of, of two points. So, and that's what we consider, just this. So these are two valued functions, which I just map u from, say, an open domain, so open bounded. And, and let's say also smooth, that's not the point, in a flat space, and m is always the dimension of my, of my object, of my current, to this space of two points in Rn. And then will be always the codimension, so which will be one or greater than one. This, the important case is, is when n is, uh, is greater than one. So in this picture, it's like that here we have Rm as the horizontal space, and the vertical space will be our Rn. And we consider two points in this Rn. So that's the splitting of our, of our space. And now, this one is, of course, a metric space. Here I introduced a metric. And I can talk about continuous function, measurable function, Lipschitz function, all that. That's the same as for any application between metric spaces. So this one is kind of, uh, of clear. The next step is to try to define a, a derivative for such a function. Because remember, our aim in the end will be, in some sense, to analyze the minimizers of the area of the mass of these currents. And the mass for a graph, it's, um, it's expressed by the, the, the integration of, of a first derivative. So, so that's, so the area of the graph of u is the integral of, of the Jacobian of u. A the Jacobian is nothing else than uh, the square root of the determinant of du transpose du. So somehow we need to have a notion of, of derivative there. And now this space is, is perfectly nice, it's Rm, but this one is a metric space. So the point is trying to define for this class of function a notion of derivative there, or, or, or weak derivative. So what we, we introduce now are generalized Sobolev functions. Okay, let me say there are many different ways to introduce Sobolev functions uh, between metric spaces. And here, actually, it's also easier because this one is uh, an Euclidean space. And, um, but the way I find more convenient is uh, a way which is going back to to Ambrosio in the, in the 90s, which is looking at composition with the Lipschitz functions. So I say that a function is Sobolev if every composition with the Lipschitz function is, uh, is a Sobolev function. So let me give uh, a formal definition. So um, we say that u from omega into this space of two points. And when I don't indicate the, the dimension, it's kind of always m and n there, is, let's say, w1p if there exists a function phi in lp of omega. And this one now is, is the usual lp space. So this one is a function from omega into r. And actually, I mean, we can take positive. So that there exists phi in LP such that the following holds. And we need two conditions here. So the first one is that every composition needs to be Lipschitz. So instead of taking generic Lipschitz functions, I will take composition with a distance function. 
So I, I say for every t in my space of Q points, the map, which now it's a real valued map. So it goes from omega into r, and at each x, I associate the distance of uh, u of x from t, which is now a number. So this map here, it's now actually a real valued map. And I ask that for every t, this map is Sobolev, w1p. So meaning LP and the, general, the general, uh, generalized gradient in LP. But then what is important is that all this composition needs to have a, a common dominant for the gradient. So then, which is this function phi here, I ask that the, the weak, the norm of the weak derivative of this composition, so for every t, the norm of this uh, weak derivative is pointwise dominated by phi. A pointwise means, of course, the weak derivative almost everywhere in omega. No, that's pointwise. So for almost every x, this one is a, a, a finite value and has to be controlled by this function phi. And also phi is defined almost everywhere because it's just an LP function. So it's, it's really pointwise, almost every x, say, in omega. That's what we ask. Now this one is a, an exercise which I put in the notes. So that's somehow the, the most economic way to introduce this space, but it's like asking this property for every Lipschitz composition. And that's what is important there. So exercise U belongs to W1P omega AQ if and only if f composition u belongs to w1p omega and the derivative of f composition u is less or equal than uh, a, the Lipschitz constant of f times uh, phi almost everywhere. And that uh, needs to be true for every f Lipschitz from AQ. So it's, for this hour, I mean, I try to remember it's a metric space. So every Lipschitz function from AQ to R. Okay, that's an exercise. I've been mean, asking that property just for the distant function is the same as asking for every Lipschitz function. A Lipschitz function, it's, it's a way to know a metric space somehow. So that's, that's why this kind of notion is uh, it's, it's so reasonable. Okay, question on this, because somehow this one is one of the key points of, uh, of what I'm going to, to present. Uh, and next one is, is the energy. So trying to define a, a, a trying to, to define the area function for this kind of, uh, of multiple values. Object. So in some sense, we need uh, to define. Uh, so the next part of the hour, we will spend to understand how to define the area, the area function, or a variant of this. Now we will see. So, And the first step we do here is, in some sense, to immediately to simplify our uh, our object, which is, I mean, it's also what is done in the in the theory in codimension one. Instead of looking at the area function, we look at the at the linearized uh, energy. So, as I wrote you, grazie. So the area of the graph of a function u 
is given by the integral of the Jacobian. And now, if, if, if we kind of linearized this function in, uh, in the first order, you get actually that this one is the integral of one plus du squared over two plus a remainder, which is a big O of du to the fourth. So in some sense, a very cheap way to define this energy would be just to define the modulus of du. And that's what we are going to do. So the rest of this hour will be to understand these objects here. Okay. So this formula, I mean, don't take too seriously. I mean, that should be another U, which is the one which has also the first components, the identity somehow. But <laughs> it remains true that uh, this one is, uh, is the expression. So now try to, to define the U. And looking at this, and this uh, definition here, there would be a kind of very, very natural guess, which is, okay, I take the minimum phi realizing these properties. And this one is my du. Because every gradient of this one Lipschitz map is dominated by phi. So this one is very reasonable, but it's the wrong energy. And actually, the energy will be defined and will be clear at the end of this hour, exactly by this property here. That it, it, it needs to be the first order expansion of the area function. So it really needs to be the Dirichlet energy. And now, if you look at this energy here for, for vector value map, this one is not the Dirichlet energy. This one is uh, the um, operator norm of the gradient. So it's not the, the Hilbert Schmidt norm. So we need to do something else. And, uh, and for this, the expression of the energy we introduce is one which is a sum on the partial derivative, in which case the two norms coincide. So now we have a map like this. And it's, a, it's a different U. You have X, X, U of X. So this one is, a, I should put here, say, a big U. X, U of X. So that's the map. Hmm. Yes. And this one, the derivative of this gives the one in the expansion. Okay, so, so what about du? So we defined, um, so before defining the modulus of du, we define the partial derivative, the modulus of the partial derivative of du. So we take dj of u, and look, I, I write like this, but this one is kind of uh, an independent object. So it's not the modulus of a derivative up to now, but it's just a quantity positive quantity, which, is, which will be an LP function. Uh, and it's given by the optimal phi there for the partial derivative in J, which I mean, it's not difficult to recognize that this one is the, the supremum over a dense, um, a countable dense set of, uh, of points in this space of two points of the modulus of the partial derivative of this composition. So I select a countable then set of points there. I look all of this composition, all the partial derivative, and I take the supremum point wise almost everywhere for this quantity. And then the right quantity to look, the u squared, is exactly the sum on the partial direction, on the, on, the, on the different direction from one to m of this partial derivative squared. So this one now, we will see in a while why it's, it's the right quantity for the energy. And note that in general, when we have a map 
with the values into a metric space. In, it's, it's very simple. There are many different definitions for defining the, the modulus of, of a gradient, but not for defining a pointwise gradient. This one is something which is, which, which is general, much more subtle. In this case, I mean, we can define also a pointwise gradient. And now we will spend the rest of today's lectures for doing this, in order to understand a, a bit better this class of maps here. And we will see that these pointwise gradients will match this energy we have in, introduced here. So up to now, all the theory I've written up to now, it's possible to, to be done for generic metric space here. So complete metric space here. You may define this energy, Sobolev class like this. And from now on, we exploit the structure of two points, actually, a bit more in details. So now we try, so let me see if I forgot something. No. To give a notion of, of pointwise differential. Okay, for doing this, let me first say something on, uh, on, uh, on the representation of this multiple values function. So given a function u from omega into this space of two points, it's always possible to find q in terms of number, different measurable functions whose sum as measure gives this function u. So, and I mean, it's very far away from being unique. So Q measurable functions. So U1, UQ from omega into Rn such that u of x is exactly the sum of d Dirac deltas in ui of x. So this one is it's a, very, a, a very useful way to, to name the values of this function there. So in, in some sense, I'm not claiming anything about this UI. So I'm not saying, for example, that when we start from a continuous function, the UI are continuous. That's not possible. Or when we start from a Sobolev function, the UI are Sobolev. I'm just saying that we can give a label in a consistent way, which is very non-unique, in order to represent function U as a superposition, that's what we call superposition or selection of measurable functions, UI. But in general, this one will be just measurable. And the proof of this statement is, uh, is by induction. I gave like uh, an exercise in the notes, and there are hints for the proof of this. And it's not so deep. I mean, it may, be, it may seem strange somehow, because I said that we cannot order the value. But when I said we cannot order the value is in a consistent way, in such a way that, I mean, when we have uh, a continuous function, our values are ordered in a continuous way. That's impossible. But in a measurable way, so just giving a, a label which is measurable, we can do. And that's, I mean, uh, it's always possible. And we will use this writing here just as a way to write our function. So nothing special, just, uh, just having a, a way to name each value at x. So that's the only use we will make of this proposition. Which, I mean, by the way, the proof is uh, it's very simple by induction, the, and it's given in the notes. Okay. 
So you measurable, yes. So that's kind of the minimum regularity I always assume. Okay, what is wrong is when you substitute this measurable word with any other words there. So if, if you have Lipschitz and then you find Q Lipschitz function, it's impossible. So Obolev, Q Sobolev function, that's impossible. So that's the only wording in this kind of, uh, of statement there. So, but this one is useful because, I mean, it uh, allows us to, to use this notation and to introduce this notion of pointwise differential. So, that's the definition. So, we say that U is differentiable. at x not in omega if, if there exist Q matrices. So L1, LQ, and I mean we see as linear map from Rm to Rn. So linear map such that. And now we give the two conditions for the differentiability there. So the first one is that now, now we set a notation for the first order differential of the map. So T x at x zero of u. That's kind of the tangent map uh, to u at x zero, which is uh, so. Let's use now y as a variable. So this one is the, sol the sum of these deltas at l i y minus x zero plus u i of x zero, and then here you see the first use. It, it's just a way to, to label these values. So this one is uh, a sum of two different linear maps uh, based this uh, affine map uh, at, uh, at ui of x0. So once we set this, then uh, we have that the distance between u of uh, uh, y and this linear map here, as usual for a differential, is a little o of, uh, it's an infinitesimal of, of the distance. So that's, so I'm, I'm telling you what is the linear, the differential of this map, and I ask for the usual differentiability properties that it has to be infinitesimal with the distance to the phone. So, so this one is quite, it's quite natural, but there is an extra condition which makes this notion a bit more precise. And an extra condition is that every time we have here a point with a, a higher multiplicity, also the linear map should coincide, should be the same. So Li is equal to Lj if uh, Ui of x not is equal to Uj of x naught. So now let's explain this, this definition with a picture. So basically what we say is that a point is, um, so, so let's do the first case where we have exactly the superposition of two different uh, smooth functions. So let's say Q equals two smooth functions, which are kind of disjoint. So we have uh, here our two functions, 
and our two values function is the superposition of the, this very, very smooth two function, then at a point x0 in the domain, we, we may take the differential of these two, so this affine map here, and our differential for the map will be just the superposition of these two differentials. And, and this one will be a, a point of differentiability for our map. Another case is when the function are not are not disjoint. So always Q equal to, but we have a situation like this. So like uh, a branch point, for example. So this and this. So the map comes together. And this one is our point X naught. Then we say that X naught is a point of differentiability if we can find a double linear map which approximate this function there. Why double? Because if the points coincide, the linear function has to coincide. So here we need to find the common tangent plane to the two, which approximate to an infinitesimal of the distance our two values function. So this, this one will be taken with the multiplicity two. And this one is still a point of differentiability for us. What is not a point of differentiability, and it's kind of, of questionable, but this just makes this definition a bit more restrictive, is when we have a two-value function which behaves like this. In principle, now it's linear. Let's, uh, let's do less linear. In principle, here we have two very nice differential functions, and the superposition of these two is a good approximation for our function u, but nevertheless, we don't consider this point a point of differentiability. Because the point is the same, but the linear map are different. So that's what we exclude from our definition of, of differential point. And I mean, the reason why this case is excluded, now it's a bit vague. And, uh, I cannot explain kind of completely, but it comes from the fact that, in some sense, all the all the core of the theory is 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 somehow to look at the space of Q points in as a, a union of stratified space. So the two, the multiplicity two points, we would like to see as in, independent from the multiplicity one point. So to do this means that they need to have their own differential, which is a multiplicity two differential. So the definition may seem a bit weird because that picture is perfectly nice in terms of surface. That one is kind of an image with a self-intersection of surface. But nevertheless, for the theory, it's more convenient to take and, and actually suffice to take this, uh, this more restrictive definition. But it's mostly used later, this. So at, at this point, it's not completely justified why, why we consider this, uh, this second condition here. OK, and now, now we make a little break of 10 minutes, and, and we resume at, uh, at 9.40. And for the second hour, I mean, we will see uh, that actually this kind of pointwise differential exists almost everywhere for Sobolev functions. And we'll give another way to write the energy, which will be kind of, uh, a, of more convenient for certain computations. OK, so we resume in 10 minutes here. <laughs> OK, let's start uh, again very, very slowly. So, OK, so now we have a notion of differentiability for our maps, which is this one, which is uh, uh, shown in these pictures. It will be completely unuseful if, if we cannot say that our functions are differentiable. So the first thing we have to do is somehow to prove a sort of Rademacher theorems, so that at least we can define our differential almost everywhere for our functions. So this one will be next step, which is 
a generalized Rademacher's theorem. So which, at the beginning, I mean, we will state just for, for Lipschitz function. So the theorem will be, we take f from omega to a q in Lipschitz. And I recall you, the notion of Lipschitz function between two metric space, it's, a, it's the standard one. So the distance is not a, Expand it up to a factor L. Then, uh, so then F is is differentiable at almost every point. In omega. So this means that for almost every x naught in omega, we find such a collection of linear maps with the properties I wrote, I wrote before. Okay, and now we try to give a proof of this, uh, of this result. So it won't be a complete proof, but almost complete, let's say, because all the ideas of the proof will be uh, inside here. So. So proof is more a sketch. And what we do to illustrate this phenomenon of, of the proof is to consider the special case of two values function. So Q equal two. I don't know if I started a bit in advance, but So, and the point is the following. So, as I told you, the idea, what we, uh, to treat this multiple value function is somehow to go, to go down and distinguish between multiplicity one, multiplicity two, and so on, inductively. With the, with the formalism now, which is, I mean, it's, a, it's completely independent from these combinatorics, because we have this notion of, uh, of metric space, but nevertheless, this one is kind of behind you know, this argument. So when Q is equal to, what we can do is distinguish between points of multiplicity one and multiplicity two. So we call omega tilde, let's say, the points X in omega with the multiplicity two, which are the one where the, the two values of our function are equal. And then we look separately omega tilde and omega minus omega tilde. And notice that omega tilde is a closed set. Because F is, uh, is, uh, is Lipschitz, so it's continuous, and this one is defined by inequality. So it's very simple to see that it's a closed set. And this one is, uh, on the other end, open. Okay, what happened here? So outside of omega tilde, we have two values which are different. So let's argue with the picture. So we have, so for every x naught in uh, omega minus omega tilde, f1 of x naught it's different from F2 of X naught. And so we see basically, so that's our X naught in our space. We see basically two different values for such a function. Now the function is continuous. So now I'm not going to prove this, but uh, it's Lipschitz, it's Lipschitz continuous. The two values are different. This implies that these two leaves of the function cannot meet in a neighborhood of this point. So, so there exists a neighborhood of X naught such that here I really see two different, two different leaves of my functions. 
And now the function was globally Lipschitz. It's very simple to say that F1 and F2 are also Lipschitz in a neighborhood of X0. So in some sense, in this neighborhood, we can apply the classical Rademacher theorem and find the differential for both functions almost everywhere. And now, I mean, we cover all this set, so here. And now it's a very simple to verify via the, the definition. So by the very definition at the beginning, this map here, so I one to two of the F I X naught Y minus X naught plus F I X naught this one is a, a differential for our two values function. So I say a differential, but you see from the definition that when x is, the differential is unique. So it's d differential or d derivative of f. So when we have these two values which are, which are split, then we argue as, as if we had normal uh, normal or classical function there. So the only thing we need to understand is what happened in, uh, in omega tilde. Okay, is it clear this? Are you familiar with this, uh, with this classical Rademacher theorem? Which you say that when you have a Lipschitz function, it is differentiable almost everywhere with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So all the things we need now is to understand this multiplicity two set. So in omega tilde f1 is equal to f2. And now omega tilde is not the entire space, but we can use an extension theorem for Lipschitz function, so for example the Keith Brown theorem, and say that F1, F2 coincide with the restriction to omega tilde of a Lipschitz function. G. Okay, so on this set the two values coincide. The function there was, was Lipschitz, so in particular, considering these two values kind of separately, they are Lipschitz, they are the same value, and they coincide so with the, we can extend them and look at an extension of this Lipschitz function. And now this G I use for defining which points I look for the differentiability of, of this. And I say that I consider points X naught in omega tilde with these two properties. So the first one is that they need to be points of density one for omega tilde. Which I recall you, what does it mean? It means that if I look at the measure of omega tilde in a smaller ball around x naught, it has to cover almost all the ball. So the limit R going to zero of BR x naught intersected omega tilde renormalized by the measure of BR is going to one. So it's covering everything around this point x naught. And then since G is Lipschitz itself, I look at the point of differentiability for G. So x naught of differentiability for G. And now what I claim is that for all these points, x naught with these two properties, actually my function f was, was differentiable. And notice that by the Lebesgue theorems, almost every point in, in omega tilde is a density one point. So this one is a condition which is satisfied almost everywhere. And now here I, I apply again my Rademacher theorem in the classical case, 
And I know that G is, is, is differentiable almost everywhere. So these two conditions are satisfied almost everywhere. So would it suffice to prove the differentiability for points with these two properties? It's a, it's a full measure why, set. Why is so that's uh, actually a theorem, I mean, which is not uh, a trivial theorem, which is based on, uh, on, on the Besikovic coverings, coverings theorems, which says that if you take as a measure, for example, the Lebesgue measure restricted to the set uh, omega tilde, you can find a differential almost everywhere with respect to, 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 to the Lebesgue measure. And this one will give you the density of the mesh, which is one on omega tilde, zero outside. So you know that almost everywhere this ratio is coincide with the density, which is one inside and zero outside. But this theorem, I mean, it's not trivial at all. It's a very deep theorem in measure theory. So now we are, we are left with this task, so which is to prove the, the differentiability at this point there. So let me fix some, uh, some notation. So, so the claim, the claim is, uh, so F is differentiable at, uh, at at x naught s in a me and so let's make this claim a bit more precise the the linear function to f at x naught is exactly twice the linear function associated with g so twice dg x naught y minus x naught plus g of x naught, which is the same as f1 or f2 of x naught. So this one is, uh, is my claim. So let's prove this. So, so we set r equal, so, so, so let's say, we consider a point y in omega and, and set r equal the distance between y and x naught. So now, always with the pictures. So this one is our point of, uh, our, our candidate point of differentiability. We have uh, our set omega tilde which is a full set around x naught. So something may, may be missing from, from omega tilde, but always few and few once we approach x naught. And now we try to verify the definition of differentiability at this point. So we consider another point y, and, and we try to prove that the distance between the linear part and the function is infinitesimal with the distance of these two points. And what we do is, so we consider the balls, which is twice this, around x naught. So b to r x naught. And let's take the closed balls. And now what we do is, uh, so in some sense, when y is a point in omega tilde, we know what is uh, the function there. Because in omega tilde, G was coincide with our, with our multiple values function. But when Y is not in omega tilde, we don't know what we are doing. So the best is, first of all, to find the, the, the projection of Y onto this set omega tilde. And we call this projection Y star. And Y star is a point in our good set omega tilde such that the distance between y and y star realize the one between uh, 
y and the set omega tilde inside this closed ball. And now we will always verify our condition passing through this point, y star. So, so somehow here, what we use is the fact that everything here is, is Lipschitz continuous. All our functions are, are Lipschitz continuous. Then, so here it's too low, let me go up here. So then, in order to estimate the, the distance between in f of y and the first order differential at y, we can put in between our comparison point, which is this y star. So using the triangular inequality, here we can put f of y, the distance between f of y and f of y star. And then here we put the distance between y star and, and the first order differential at y star. And finally, the distance between uh, the two first order differentials. Now, everything is, uh, is Lipschitz there. So we use the fact that f was a Lipschitz function. So here we can put Lipschitz of f y minus y star. So here we know that in y star, it's actually our good set. So in y star, our functions, the two values were coincide with the common, with the common Lipschitz functions. So this one is actually a differentiable function there. And I get a little o of y star minus y actually, because this one is, is the same as the, the, the distance between, so twice the distance between g of y star minus the linear part of g at y star, which now is a, it's the usual differential for one function. So this one is a, by the, the second condition that g was differential about there, it's an infinitesimal of the distance. And here we use that, again, this one is a Lipschitz function. It's very simple to see that the Lipschitz constant of uh, the linear part is the same of f. So here we have, again, uh, the Lipschitz constant of f times the distance. And we would like to see that all of these, so that's a bit our claim is an infinitesimal of the distance between y and x naught. So that's what we would like to prove. So that's the claim. So. Okay, let's see first, first this one here. So this point Y star is a point inside our ball B2R. And R was chosen exactly to be the distance between Y and X naught. So I have here an extra factor two, but that term there, so let me copy first these two. This term here is at most two times r, which is exactly y minus x naught. So this one is fine. Now the only thing we need to care, the Lipschitz constant is finite of f, we need to care what is the distance between uh, y and y star, which is the only thing we, we do not control. So this distance here. We would like to see that it is infinitesimal with the radius of the ball. So why this? Here we use the first condition oh, for our point. And we use that actually this y could have been outside our set, but the space I have outside omega tilde is very small because it was a point of density one. So here I take a ball around y with radius 
y minus y star. So this is b, y minus y star centered at y. And you see that this one was the point realizing the distance with omega tilde. So this one is contained in uh, omega minus omega tilde. Intersected with the ball B to R. So in some sense, I have an indirect uh, measure for this distance because I know that the, the volume of this set is very small because it's, it's contained in the complement of this, uh, of this set here. So how can I estimate that distance there? So this one, uh, up to a dimensional constant, which depends just on the space uh, dimension, is exactly like uh, the, uh, the measure of this ball here to the one over m. And now I, I renormalize for the ball br. So I put here r and here the ratio between this measure, the measure of these balls, and b to r. Okay. And here, I mean, I'm changing this constant from line to line. There is a factor to uh, an extra dimensional factor there. But I use now this information here, that actually this ball was contained in the exceptional set. So that volume all to the power 1 over m. So this volume here is less or equal than a constant times r. But remember what was r. r is the distance between uh, y and x naught. So that's uh, r. And then I have this ratio here, which is br, b to r, I can put, intersected omega minus omega tilde divided by b to r to the power 1 over m. And now we are done. So omega tilde at, at x0 density 1. So this means that the complement of omega tilde has density 0 at, uh, at uh, x0. So this ratio here, we know just by the density properties that this ratio here is going to 0 as r goes to 0. That's by property A. So altogether, this one is y minus x naught times an infinitesimal. So little o of y minus x naught, which is what we wanted to, to, to prove. Because now this one is already a little o of the distance, this one as well, and this claim is, uh, is proven. So just, just summarizing this proof, so what we have done was was looking first at the points where the function were, were splitted. And there we know that we can apply our classical or the market theorem, finds two differentiable functions which approximate our function there. And then we looked at the point with the multiplicity two. And we select kind of good points, which were points of density one and points of differentiability for the double function living on that set, which is what we call G, the central point. Now, for that point there, with this computation, we verify that we have a differential. And the differential is exactly twice the linear part of G, which, I mean, turns out to be good with our definition because for a double point, we need a differential which is twice a linear function. And that's what we verified. That's the distance between F and twice this linear function is actually infinitesimal with the point. So I conclude the proof here, but just a few words how to proceed for further coup. That's just by induction, again. So now look at, the, at three values. We may split in one values, two, one, and three. And the only thing you really have to care is the multiplicity is three, because the two, one you can treat already, and the one was the classical or the market theory. And then you proceed with the, up to your Q. So this one is a just part of the proof, but all the, all the ideas are somehow here. I'm sorry, I'm still a little bit confused about the, the Pecovich theorem with the convolution. Because uh, in G, 
general, the omega-2 is a closed close set, and in many cases, it has zero measure, right? Hmm. Yes, but in, so in that case, I mean, you don't care. So if omega t is, is measure ah, zero, yeah. you, you don't need to prove anything about that, uh, that set. Because okay. the final claim of the proposition is that you are differentiable almost everywhere. So in that case, we need just to consider the, the matter is positive. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So in, in that case, the classical Rademacher theorem would suffice. <laughs> Okay, so this one is, a, is kind of an important theorem because we have the notion of differentiability, but we need to know if our functions are differentiable because otherwise the notion was kind of, of empty. And now what we know is that as a Lipschitz function, which is nothing else than a Sobolev function W1 infinity, is, is uh, differentiable almost everywhere. And now, this one is not difficult to see in the notes I, I gave the details. But as for classical Sobolev function, you, you can prove the differentiability almost everywhere when the exponent of the, of the Sobolev class is not infinity. So, so this one is now a corollary of this, uh, of this, of this theorem. So, but let's state as a proposition. So, Every u in the Sobolev class W1p omega aq is, and now here I have to add a little word, approximate, differentiable almost everywhere in omega. So what does it mean? Let me just explain in words what does it mean approximate differential. So it's not the pointwise notion of differentiability like, uh, like for, for Lipschitz function. That's, I mean, we cannot claim for Sobolev functions, but for every point you have a, a, a set of, of, of full measure where your function, a density one at that point, where your function turns out to be differentiable. So it's really kind of the same notion approximate. That's a way to see this in terms of measure theory. But what is important is somehow that this one allows us to define the, the differential almost everywhere. And uh, in the notes you find the proof. What is behind this, this proposition is a losing type approximation theorem. You know that a Sobolev function coincides with the Lipschitz function on big sets. So where it coincides with the Lipschitz function, you have a differential. Since the set is not the entire set, this one will turn out to be just an approximate differential. But the proof is, is actually just a, a kind of losing type approximation theorem. But you find the details in the notes, so I don't want to spend much time on this. The only thing I mean I, I would like to fix now is, so now we know that given such a Sobolev function, we have a differential. So let's fix the a, a bit more notation on this. So always I called this linear map Li. But actually, the second condition, which says that, uh, so that's just a remark on the notation. So since, since Li was equal to Lj whenever Fi of x was equal to Fj of x, huh? somehow we, we make no confusion in writing Li so we can write Li equals to dFi at x. So in, the, in, in this case, our differential, in terms of notation, takes the usual form, which is the first order Taylor expansion of f at y is the superposition of dFi of x naught, y minus x naught, plus fi of x So, but let me remark that this one is just a notation. So I'm not claiming that pointwise each fi is differentiable. I say that I call this linear map dfi, and I make no confusion because when two f's coincide, also the linear map coincide. 
So there, the fi will be the same. So this one is, uh, is just a way to take advantage from the notation. Somehow. And introduce us to the next point, which is uh, how to, to rewrite the energy. So now, at the beginning, we introduce this energy. And now what I claim is that, so that's a proposition again. Is that for U W1P omega AQ, D of U, uh, let's say squared, is exactly the sum of the Q values of these linear maps, almost everywhere in omega. So at the beginning, we gave a metric definition of the U squared, which was taking the supremum on all the composition, taking the partial derivative, and summing these values. Now we have a pointwise notion of differentiability. And actually, the claim of the proposition is that these two energies coincide. So you can take the sum of these, uh, of these uh, a, a norm squared. And this one is the Hibbert. Uh, Schmidt norm of these matrices squared, and this one will, will reconstruct our energy at the beginning. In some sense, the, the, this proposition, now I don't have time to give details of the proof, but in the notes you find it. Huh? It's important because it justified our energy. So because when our U was actually the superposition of smooth functions, you know that, so U1, U2, U3, you know that the right expansion at the first order of the, of the area functional is this. So now what I'm saying is that at least the energy I introduced at the beginning is, uh, is giving me the right first order expansion in the, in the smooth case. And that's a way to see that this quantity is, uh, is one way to justify the introduction of this quantity here. It's exactly the the first non-constant terms in the area function. OK. And this one close somehow the first part of the theory. So let me just, just summarize what we have seen up to now. So we started from this example, which was a, so our leading example. We will always draw this picture on the, on the blackboard. So the picture of a, a, a complex uh, branch points. Then here, we would like somehow to, to write this branch point as a graph of uh, a multi-valued function, because there is no way to write as a graph of one function. But for this multi-valued function, we need uh, to develop a first order differential calculus. And that's what we did. So we have a notion of Sobolev functions. We have a notion of pointwise differential. We have a notion of, uh, a, of modulus of this, of this uh, Differential. So now, in some sense, we can start doing the analysis on these uh, on these objects and try to find solution to some uh, minimization problem or or to some PDS. And uh, so that's of course it's a, a, a no smooth analysis because our space is no smooth. It's, it's just a metric space with this with this combinatorical structure. But this one is kind of enough to allow to do almost all the procedure for the, for the, for the usual calculus. And now what we, we will start today, and, and probably we will finish tomorrow, is, is to see that actually we can find solution to minimization problem in this context. Now, of course, we should look at the minimization of the area in principle. But that one is a nonlinear problem, which is technically more, more difficult then looking at the denialized uh, equation, which is the Laplace equation. So let's focus on the Laplace equation, which anyhow, in the proof of the nonlinear case, will come in somehow. So what we look now is uh, a generalized 
harmonic. So, harmonic bracket functions. In this case of of, um, of multiple values function. So what we try to do is to define harmonic functions as the minimizers of the Dirichlet energy. So let's introduce the generalized Dirichlet energy. Which, uh, I mean, now we have everything ready. Will be just the integral of our domain of, of the U squared. And that's a, a definition for this energy. We, we can define the boundary value problem and say that U is harmonic, or in this context is called dir minimizing, if it is a solution of this variational problem. So the formal definition is U is called dir minimizing. And this one, keep in mind, is a synonym in this no smooth case of harmonic. If the integral of the u square in omega is equal to the minimum of this integral of df squared in omega, where the minimum is taken among all the function w12 from omega to a q, such that the trace is the same as, uh, as the one of u. So which means, so we define the trace in terms of the composition with the distance function. So the, for every t, the trace of the composition u t is equal to the, to the trace of the composition of f. So this equality is met uh, in the usual sense of traces, and we test for every, with the distance to every point on, uh, on, on the space of two points. And then sometimes I don't need, I don't know if, if, uh, if we need later, but we will call, we will just write this condition as uh, F on the boundary equal u of the mountain. But this one will mean that all the compositions are the same on the boundary. So a, a function minimizing such energy with a given trace is what we call the minimizing. And now what are the basic theorems about this? Uh, this minimization problem. So at least we need to, uh, at least one of them, which is the existence of, uh, of solution. So, existence of the minimizing functions. So, we would like somehow to show that we are able to, to solve this Dirichlet problem for, for such a, an energy. So given uh, G in W12 omega AQ, there exists U in, uh, in the same space, W12 AQ, did minimizing. with uh, u at the boundary equal g at the boundary of omega. Which, I mean, I remember the boundary, we just look at, at the composition. It's nothing uh, uh, exotic there. So the, the first theorem is uh, on the existence. And then we have a first basic regularity theorem, which is how regular are uh, the harmonic function in this, uh, in this, in this no smooth setting. Harmonic function in the classical settings are analytic. Here, they are, they are not analytic, but they are just, just continuous. So this one would be a first result, and the second one is uh, the regularity. So 
So every u they're minimizing. is all the continuous. With exponent alpha, which depends just on the dimension and the number of values in the interior. So this one is the starting part of, of the theory. So actually, we can find solution to this problem, and they are somehow more regular than just being sobre function. They are continuous, but nothing more than continuous. And the reason why they are nothing more than continuous, you see also with the examples of, of uh, harmonic uh, with, um, of complex varieties. Because the complex variety, Camilo showed you that there are examples of minimizing currents, but actually there are also examples of de-minimizing function, where they can be written as a, a multiple covering of a plane. So this one, of course, is more than all the continuous, but we, we could have parameterized this, this complex variety with respect to the to the wrong plane, which is the Z plane. In that case, what we look, what we see is something like this, which is, a, which is continuous. But here it's not differentiable, because the slope here is going to infinity. This one is kind of the same curve parameterized with respect to, to the wrong plane. This one gives an example of a, a de-minimizing function, and it is just all the continuous. So also, the, this result here is sharp. Hmm? No? So this one, for example, is an example where it, it is not Lipschitz. It looks like, uh, so, so w here is like equal plus or minus, uh, now it's a, uh, I mean, you have here a different number of columns. But it looks like z to the two third. So here you have three, three sheets coming there. Okay. Now we have just just few minutes left. So let me just just comment on this first part, and then tomorrow we we will start with the with the regularity part. And the first part, I mean, now I can uh, I can go somehow very fast because. It's uh, an application of uh, uh, the direct method in the calculus of, of variation, about which Alessio spoke, spoke yesterday. So for this class of function, we have all the ingredients. And for this energy, we have all the ingredients for applying this method. So these are really the last comments on the, so more than a proof will be just comments on the existence of the minimizer. And the point is that one can apply, can be, in some sense, the existence can be reduced via the, the direct method. In, uh, in the calculus of variations. And in particular, the ingredients were that we have the compactness, the, the, the sequentially uh, weak uh, compactness for, for sequences of function, which means whenever we have Fk so sequence of function with uh, the trace of Fk at the boundary fixed and the energy equibounded. Then there exists a subsequence and an F 
such that we have convergence in, uh, in L2. So this one is the classical compact Sobolev bending. So whenever I have a sequence with an equibounded Sobolev norm, I can find the subsequence converging L2. The proof is very elementary and just pass through the composition. Because these Sobolev functions are defined in terms of composition with the distance. So for every composition, I can apply kind of the same uh, argument and then pass to the limit. So it's not 100% exactly like this, but the basic idea is this. The second element is that actually the trace is continuous in this, uh, in this uh, limiting process. So let me write here, and actually the trace is, uh, is, uh, is kept. And that's again, the trace operator for classical Sobel functions was, uh, was continuous under weak convergence. And here, I mean, the trace is, is defined already in terms of composition with the Lipschitz map. So this one passes in a natural way into the limit. And the second element was the lower semi-continuity under this, uh, this, uh, this uh, sequentially weak uh, convergence, lower semi-continuity of the Dirichlet energy. So which means that the Dirichlet energy of the limit is less or equal than the limit of the Dirichlet energy of, of the sequences as k goes to infinity. Okay, very few comments also about these points. I mean, in the notes you, you find the, the proof also of this. It's a, uh, also here, the ingredients are very elementary. And, the, and uh, to prove this lower semi-continuity, one of the best way is to use the first, the very first definition I gave of the F squared, which was the supremum of all these partial, all the norms of this partial derivative on the composition of functions. Then, of course, this one is a supremum on a, on a countable set, but by via an approximation, you, you, you can reduce as a limit on a supremum on a finite set. And now, for a finite set, you have on each set a, a different composition, but on that set, that composition is converging weakly. So you may apply the usual lower semi-continuity and then sum back to reconstruct the, the entire energy. So again, also at this point, the philosophy is that since the energy is defined in terms of composition and the compositions are a lower semi-continuous, then this property remains in, the, in this context of, uh, of Q-values function. Of course, you have to pay a bit of attention because the lower semi-continuity you have to test on open set, so you have to approximate uh, properly your partition where you put the different compositions. But apart from these technical details, here the, the proof is really the classical one. So DF is the soup of a composition of Lipschitz functions, so the gradient of, of regular Sobolev functions, and this one is lower semi-continuous. So once we have this ingredient, with a, with a mechanism, as you explained yesterday, so you take a minimized sequence, you have compactness, so you, you extract a converging subsequence, and the energy of this, of this subsequence will be the minimum energy. So you solved the existence of this, uh, this de-minimizing function. Okay, for today, I will stop here, and I'll, I'll give you time for questions, and tomorrow we will start seeing some details on this regularity result that this function are a bit more than Sobolev, they are continuous. And that's actually the best we can do. So if you have questions, that's all. Where do we find the notes? Hmm? Where do we find the notes? So that's, I don't know, they should be on the web page. Okay. That's all. Yeah. Uh, so, so they are already there. <laughs> hmm? Other questions? So let's have the coffee break.